starting the recording instruction is a mandate. <laughs> you know, um, so apparently we have to get everybody's okay. Do you get a okay? Now this is for the online students <laughs> because they'll get a prompt if they're okay to stay or not okay to stay because it's being recorded. Okay. Anyway, okay. So we'll we'll just read from uh, Galatians five. Okay, before we start, uh, Galatians five and verse sixteen says, "I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh." Okay. So what does it say? Walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So it goes on to say, "What is the work of the flesh?" Right? What is it that the flesh is capable of? Um, what is the flesh? You know, it could be a bodily desires, appetites. It could be also uh, we see it's an unrenewed part of us, you know, our mind which is not renewed or which is not in agreement with God's word. Okay, so so it says that this is the work of the flesh, and it's evident, and it gives a big list there. And in verse twenty-two. But the fruit of the spirit, which means the the end result of the work of the Holy Spirit in our in our lives in our heart, and this is what it results in, right? Love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control, and against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. So um, there is that instruction to be influenced by, or to to walk. Meaning, you know, when you say walk, it is to live everyday thing, right? Not just an event, but an everyday thing, right? Uh, because uh, we live, we we move, we walk, and and we, and these are used figuratively, right? Run. Uh, run the race, walk. So it's it's part of our life, part of our lifestyle, right? So if we walk in the spirit, it says let us also live. Um, let, sorry, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. So coming back to verse sixteen, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Okay. So that entire list that we see, right? Six, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, whatever we see there. The key is this, if we walk in the spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, sometimes you know we think you know these things are too strong. You know, it seems like a stronghold, it, uh, it's too, too strong and how can I ever be free from these things? Okay, the key is this, walk in the spirit. Right? Um, so you know, let's just pray today and say, Lord, you, you enable me to walk in the spirit. You know, you teach me to walk in the spirit. So walking in the spirit would mean to listen to the Holy Spirit. Would mean you know we um, are obedient to the prompting of the Holy Spirit, right? So so let's pray. Okay. Okay. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for this um, exhortation, for this instruction in your Word, Lord. That if we walk in the Spirit, God, if we are sensitive to the prompting, leading, and if we are obedient to the leading of the Holy Spirit, to the guiding of the Holy Spirit, we will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And Father God, we thank you that um, this instruction is for us as believers, God, and we know that uh, as believers, God, um, Lord, there is so much of pull towards the flesh, but we thank you, praise be to God, that we have overcome, that we can overcome, by the work of your spirit. And Lord, we thank you for this key that you've given us, for this instruction that you've given us, God, that when we walk accordingly, we will be victorious. And so, God, this morning, we uh, we just pray for our own lives, God. Each of these things that we see, oh God, that they will not be part of our lives, God. In whatever measure, God, they will not be part of our lives, Father God. And even as we learn to walk in the spirit. Teach us, Lord. Lord, lead us, O oh God, and uh, yes, Lord, we want to be attentive, Lord, to your instructions. We want to be attentive to your leading. We thank you 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. So, um, yeah. So last class, we were looking at, we were just going through the book of Acts. Right? We, we went through several scriptures. We went through the um, book of Acts. I think the last six or seven scriptures, scriptures, verses, I said, um, you know, you can go through on your own and, and uh, you know, learn from that. Um, I hope you did that. Yeah, so today we are looking at chapter six, okay, chapter six, which is the work of the Holy Spirit. So we've been looking at work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, work of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. Um, you know, just the time before the Lord Jesus came in, the work of the Holy Spirit in His life, how He ministered, um, how He emptied Himself of the sonship glory. We saw all that, right? So here today we see the work of the Holy Spirit in church history. Okay, so we're going to look at it, uh, church history. We're going to be you're going to be studying this uh, in depth um, in in another uh, you know it's, it's another subject about church history, uh, and you're going to be studying about the moves of God, etc. It's going to be in detail uh, about certain people God used, etc. Right. So so we won't go into the details, but overall we're going to look at uh, the picture of how the Holy Spirit moved in. Church history. When we say church history, we're saying you know in the history of the church, right? In the life of the church. Okay. So we see in Acts chapter two that uh, Acts chapter one and two, we see that the New Testament church starts, right? It starts to thrive, starts to flourish. If you if you read through Book of Acts, we see that hey, this is the kind of church that I want to be part of, right? This is the kind of church that I want to um, serve in. I want to minister in. You know, this uh, thriving church. What is happening? You know, people are living such radical lives that even when they are persecuted they are still sharing Christ you know that's what we saw about Philip about Stephen you know they're not just they're not worrying about themselves but they're saying okay this is the cause of the gospel and I just want to live right and uh, and we also see that they are so uh, in touch with the heart of God right so they are so sensitive that whatever instructions they receive they obey like as in case of Philip, you know, again, I'm just quoting that example because we see that there's great revival in Samaria, and um, the angel of the Lord tells him, you know, you you need to move immediately. He do does that, and then the you know, and God, the Spirit of God tells him, okay, you need to go and overtake the chariot, and he does that, right? And so also with Paul, right? Paul, uh, he writes about how. Uh, in the book of Acts, again, later you see that uh, they want to go into uh, uh, Asia, they want to go into uh, the territory, and then the Holy Spirit constrained, said, not now, and he obeyed. Right? So we see all those things happening um, in, the, in, these, in these years. But later when we study you know, uh, the history of the church, we see that the church slips into, or, you know, it, really reaches a stage which is unrecognizable right it is nowhere close to book of acts okay so what happens is that um, uh, there is this emperor constantine around 312 ad or 315 ad so um, he in in his one of his con uh, conquests he has a vision of the cross okay in in one of his he has a vision of the cross and uh, and then he he des decides to become a Christian. Now we don't know to what extent he did, right? He decides to become a Christian, and he also enforces his soldiers, his army, his um, you know wherever whichever land he conquered, he also forces them to become Christians. Okay? He says you have to do this. You have to worship Jesus only. So it was by force, and also. It became, you know, just to please the king. Okay, he's the king. He's the emperor. To please the king, I'm sure there'd be many people who would. Okay, he's saying I'll become a Christian, and he's that is what he wants. I will. So there was no heart transformation. Right? It is not like they uh, they wanted to follow Christ, or they found that okay, this is the gospel, and uh, yes, I found the truth. They they just became nominal you know, Christians. So we see that um, the church going into a lot of things like um, they built, uh, you know, they built places of worship. They built uh, 
churches and church became a church worship became a ceremony okay there it became a ceremony there was a lot of uh, wrong uh, theology heresies which crept into the church okay so they started to worship or pray to the saints uh, we read about that we see that they had a practice uh, eventually you know they had a practice of indulgences meaning uh, an indulgence is okay um, if i want to commit sin okay might seem funny now but then the fact is this is what if i want to commit sin i pay a certain price okay to the church to the priest so the priest would actually give me a license saying okay you can and then the priest also would be able to absolve or grant forgiveness for that particular sin. Okay, so it had come to that level. Okay. So you see the church where, which was preaching the gospel, uh, even though they were persecuted, they were running for their lives and wherever they went, they preached the gospel. The church had come to such a ceremonial, ritual, you know, nominal kind of a uh, Christianity. Okay. So it it had come to that level so this is what the church historian theologians call you know the dark ages okay, it's about 480 to 1480 uh, dark ages so in your notes you know uh, we can you can follow chapter 6 so church becomes spiritually you know what was thriving becomes very very feeble uh, it's not the gospel is not preached okay, everything is ritual everything is nominal okay Sunday, I need to go, I'll go. And it's all, you know, uh, uh, things are being done. A lot of liturgy okay, uh, has come in. And I'm sure it had its place, you know, uh, uh, a good place to start off. They were sincere when they put in those prayers and they wrote down those things. But then it became more of repetition. Okay, I read it out, I say it out. Um, and, and of course, a lot of wrong teaching, praying to the saints. Um, uh, and you know certain theology like purgatory okay what is purgatory you know if i die i go to that place and those who are living my my relatives maybe they do some good deeds okay and that affects my standing in purgatory and because of which you know it, i go, whether i go to heaven or hell is decided okay this mid level space so all these kinds of teachings kept into the church okay and um, the in fact, it came to a stage where the Bible, uh, it, was in, it was in Latin, uh, and it was actually kept chained, physically chained, so that the common man could not read. Okay? So the common people did not have access to the Word of God. So it had come to that kind of a stage. So the uh, Bible scholars call it, it was the Dark Ages. 480 to 1480 here and there of course there were people doing the work of ministry here and there you know there were people who were you know uh, sincerely seeking god but by and large this is what it was it was a whole millennium okay so we see that towards the end of that you know end of that age if you want to call it that end of the dark age that god raises up god starts the lord starts restoring through the work of the Holy Spirit. God starts bringing back some of those things which were lost. Okay. So one of the first things is that the church had come to a salvation of works. You do these good deeds, you'll be saved. Or you, you know, pay this kind of money, then you'll be saved from the consequence of sin. You know, all kinds of uh, erroneous teachings, right? So the first thing that came back, that the Holy Spirit restored, so we call these the restorative work of the Holy Spirit. Now, in the New Testament church, we see that salvation, you know, gospel was the thing that was preached. Right? That was what was preached throughout. People went preaching the gospel. Um, there were prophets and teachers in the church. Right? People were prophesying. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. So there was understanding about the gospel. There was understanding about water baptism. Right? There was understanding about being filled with the Holy Spirit. There was understanding about the gifts of the Spirit. It was all there. And people were thriving. There was understanding about the, uh, the fivefold ministry. 
you know, about evangelism and apostles and prophets and teachers and pastors. And so it was all there. But the church had come to this place. Right? Um, so the Lord was raising up people who would be spokespersons. You know, we see that. In hindsight, we see that. Okay, when we look back, we see that God raising up people, God bringing back the teaching that was there, right there in Scripture, bringing it back to the body of Christ. Okay, we call these the restorative moves of God or restorative uh, acts of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so for the first, the, the very first thing is, is, is that the restoration of the, the truth or the theology that salvation is by grace through faith. It's not by good works. It's not by earning, performing something and earning a credit. It is by grace. It's a work of God. Man cannot earn it. It's a work of, uh, a work of the Lord on the cross. It is by grace and through faith, meaning I receive it, I walk in it, I experience the reality of salvation when I receive it by faith. Okay, so I need to extend faith in what the Lord has done and I receive it. So Martin Luther, he was a priest in the Catholic Church um, in Germany, and and God, he got a revelation. He was he was looking at everything that was happening around, and you know the kind of uh, teachings that was going on, and something stirred up in him, and he began to start reading the scriptures, and he began to um, look into the scriptures, study the scriptures, pray, and ask the Lord, and he got this revelation. You know, God showed him that salvation. He was reading through the book of Romans, and he, he realized, hey, what we're doing is wrong. All these things I see are uh, wrong about the church, you know, how we are doing ministry and it, it, this is all wrong. So he actually nailed 99 you know, points, theses um, to the door of the, the, that particular church uh, he was serving in and he nailed it uh, there for everybody to see. It was an act of rebellion and, and uh, so his life was in danger. You know, everybody, you know, he, he was hunted down, he had to run for safety. Um, he was hunted down by the leaders of the church again. Um, and so he he did a lot of work. He translated, he wrote songs, he wrote hymns right, when he was in uh, safety. You know, I don't know if you've heard that um, old hymn, "A Mighty Fortress Is Our God." You know, that is something that he he wrote. Uh, a, a mighty fortress is our God. Um, and also, apparently, that first line of that hymn was actually used on his tombstone. You know, it was written on his. Uh, tombstone on his grave. So he did all that. And uh, um, so we call it the reformation, reformation, like reformation of theology, reformation. So, uh, you know, he was insistent. He, he had, he was convinced, convicted by the Holy Spirit and said, no matter what, this needs to go out. Okay, so we see the restorative moves of God. So we, so first thing we see the from the 1500s onwards, salvation by grace through faith. Then from the 1600s, um, the understanding of water baptism. Okay. Yes, it is symbolic, but the understanding of it, the significance of it, right? You're proclaiming that you're dead to the world. You're proclaiming that you belong to Jesus. You're procla proclaiming that you are a new creation, right? So the whole um, uh, uh, the understanding of water baptism and also the separation of church from the state. You know, what had happened was church had become very political. It reached a place where the leaders of the church, you know, like in the New Testament church, who are the leaders? Yeah, Peter, we read about Peter. In the Jerusalem church, Peter, John, right? there was James. So we read about all these people who were, you know, the leaders there. Then in the church in Antioch, of course, we read about Paul, Barnabas, and others, you know. Um, so we, we see these were the leaders. And what kind of leaders were they? You know, they were willing to put their life in danger. They were willing to go out and serve the people, you know, endure hardships. Now, the leaders of the church during the Dark Ages, they wielded great power, right? Um, now, because one thing was because Emperor Constantine, you know, he became or he enforced Christianity and he was very vehement about it. So... Uh, you know, the people who were associated with him, the, the so-called priests, were also people of great power. Okay, so they had power, they had armies, 
and they they also conquered so they fought wars and which you read about later as the crusades um, they fought wars in the name of christ there was nothing christian about it right they were conquering land and uh, they fought wars so there were armies and they it was, became very political right so uh, you know by the way politics is not a bad word but uh, you know the thing is there was they were ruling the land they were ruling it um, you know not in the right way and they were using religion to gain power okay so it had become very political so in the uh, 1600s with the revelation of the truth of water baptism also there was a separation of church from the state since hey this what we are doing you know this all this um, armies and politics and and conquering and fighting wars that's not the church we are the people of god we are the body of christ so there was a separation from the state and the church okay 1700s so so the, the lord so who who gives the revelation about the truth it's the holy spirit right we read he's the spirit of revelation and wisdom and understanding he brings so he was actually raising up people, one man, a woman, uh, man of God, woman of God, uh, maybe a bunch of people and, and uh, who were sincerely seeking and with them came, you know, through them uh, came the revelation, came the truth to the body of Christ, whoever would dare to listen. Right? And even, you know, Bible translations happened with the Reformation, a translation into several languages. And can you believe it that people were actually killed for translating the Bible? Right, just for translating the Bible into their own language, they were actually hunted down and killed. So this translations, you know, the Bible that we have has come at a great cost to us. Right, it's it's something very precious. People have actually given up or martyred their lives for the sake of translating translating the gospel, right? Translating the Bible actually. So a lot of hard work, right? And so anyway, so um, the holiness movement which was the next one uh, of church being separated from the world. Okay, so that's the, so 1700s, you see that people began to get an understanding of the fact that, okay, the Lord said, be holy for I am holy. He's a holy God. So if I'm a follower of Christ, then I need to live a holy life. Right? I need to live a life that is separate from the world. A sanctified life. If there are there, there are a lot of good things in the world, good you know um, you know maybe some culture traditions, good things, but there are also things that are uh, whose values in the world are opposite, contradictory to the word of God. Right. So I can't be part of that. So people began to get an understanding. I can't call myself a believer or a, a follower of Christ. And still be part of that. And so, uh, a move of God where there was a separation, call it the holiness movement. Okay. Um, then, 1800s brought about divine healing movement where uh, they, God again raised up teachers who would um, stand and proclaim the truth of the healing that has been purchased for us on the cross. So Isaiah 53 verses 4 and 5. And, um, you know, the fact that uh, Galatians, um, Galatians in, in the book of Galatians also, we see that um, let me just, uh, Galatians 3 and uh, verses 13, 14, right? The, what we have been redeemed from and the fact that healing for the body, for the mind has been purchased for us on the cross through the blood of Jesus. Right, so divine healing moment, movement. So the, where the Lord gave the commission saying, you will go, believers, you will go lay hands on those who are sick. Right? And, and the whole understanding of the outworking of sin, the consequence of sin. Right? So how sin affects the world, physical world, how sin affects the body, how sin affects the mind. And how the Lord has redeemed us. You know, redeem meaning? What does redeem mean? Taking back, taken us back, restored us from where we had fallen, right? Even taken us further than that, higher than that, right? So that's redemption. 
and uh, what we got redeemed from on the cross. So there's a you know so you can imagine the excitement, right? So you you think about those times when um, you know the gospel itself was not preached. Okay, you go to church, it's all you know. You don't even understand what's happening because you don't understand the language. It's in a different language. Everything is read in a different language. You don't understand it. Um, you know, you you don't understand your purpose. You don't know if you have a call, right? And everything is done by the priest. He's the central figure. So you need to go to him to, you know, for everything, each and everything, right? Um, you know, you know, from that stage, now, you know, there is this revelation that okay, there is salvation. Salvation is free. You don't have to do anything. It's already been done. You receive it by faith. It's, an, it's a work of grace. Right? You receive that. Then about holiness, about water baptism, about separation of church, you know, from the state, and you know, divine healing. You know, oh, you mean I don't have to, you know, endure the sickness? I don't have to tolerate this, right? So people began to embrace that truth, and people began to experience freedom, looking at the life. Now studying the life and ministry of Jesus. So there was a restoration of that also. Okay, then in the 1900s, the Pentecostal movement, um, bringing a revelation of the Holy Spirit, infilling the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, all the gifts of the Spirit, and so on. So, uh, so what had happened is slowly people had lost touch with this, these truths. These were foundational. You know, this was a, this was a given in the New Testament church. Right in the early church, it was these were the basics. Like if you look at it, this is how it started. Right, Peter preached the gospel. They asked, "What must we do to be saved?" He told them. They were baptized. Right, all this, and and he also gave them the instruction. You know, this gift of the Holy Spirit is for you, your children, and to also there was that knowledge and understanding, right from the beginning. But that was somehow lost because the church had lost that fire and zeal and it become a very formal nominal kind of a church okay so um, in the 1900s uh, a revelation of that truth right so so people began to understand um, and it, it was again a very exciting time because you know even in the so called let's say denominational churches okay which had a lot of form formality in worship okay. i come from a church where um you know, where i grew up uh, it was a you know anglican church like in the sense uh, we had hymns hymn book okay golden bells we sang it sang from that we also had a book of common worship okay that is still there you know whenever i go home you know that's uh, go you know, home church Mm, uh, in my hometown, sorry. So that is a book of common. So all the prayers were read out. Okay, so you read out, the pastor reads out, and then you respond. Okay, and what you need to respond is written in black, highlighted. Okay, so that you know, okay, it's black. Oh, it's my turn. I need to say. So everything is written down. Everything is formal. It's so those churches, these kind of churches, also began to experience. The freedom, the liberty of the Holy Spirit. So I saw this firsthand, okay, because my church, uh, I mean that church was uh, uh, the CSI Church, Anglican Book of Common Worship, everything. But there were a group of people, students, you know, who had come from another city, engineering students, who would come and pray. Okay, every Saturday they would come and pray, saying, "God, you know, we you saved us." Lord, save the people in this church. Okay, let many young youngsters come to the saving knowledge of Christ. Lord, let um, you know the adults. Lord, let them come to know you, God. You know, they're just coming and going, and but Lord, let them you know let them become saved. So what happened was uh, you know a few guys joined. They were curious. What what are you guys doing? Then then that this group asked the pastor okay, of the church, saying, Pastor, we can we meet after service. After this Sunday morning service, can we use that space, that hall, the back of the church? Can we meet and can we pray? Can we invite the young people? The pastor said, okay, yeah, you go ahead, do it. So they were doing that. So slowly, there were people who were getting saved, 
coming there and being filled with the spirit getting the understanding so it's you know what what kind of a church was it what kind of a service was being there followed you know traditional very very traditional in fact in the morning service you know you won't hear the gospel being preached it will be preached maybe once or twice in a year when some guest speaker would come and then some special meeting otherwise there won't be any altar call there won't be any sharing of the gospel through throughout the year 360 i know 52 sundays you won't see that right but because of this group that was praying and you know and which had this understanding the holy spirit was just using them to just bring people and at one point this youth group was about 50 to 60 in number okay 50 to 60 and it was not just people from that church but it will be people from other churches now you must understand this is the day before mobile phones this is these are the days before social media word would just get around by word of mouth okay so you're saying hey they're meeting there and it's nice why don't you try why don't you go so they would come okay so this was happening and i was one of the guys who got saved because of that group they were praying for me for many months many years actually God, somehow get this guy <laughs> we want him saved right so they used to have these youth camps and all that every time i used to rebel i used to say no i don't i found you i, I don't want to come but then they persisted you know they they were just encouraging they persisted, and and it happened so this move of god of the holy spirit of the revelation understanding of the truth in god's word i could literally literally see that in action right in front of my eyes right outside you would say oh this is a dead church what thing will happen here but inside there was something happening because of the work of the holy so we read you know uh, about many churches like even in england the i think it was called the it's called the holy trinity brampton okay, htb okay, these are all very formal churches um, even the physical structure you would see you know like cathedrals uh, a lot of uh, you know carvings and paintings and you know uh, all that but you see that god began a move the holy spirit began a move okay um um yeah uh, i see some of the comments okay about redemption i guess okay right thank you thank you nina thank you surya right so so this happened then the 2000 you know following the um, uh, pentecostal movement you know clear moves of god about the apostolic the prophetic um the, the pastoral and evangelist people had an understanding but really the move of god to restore the apostolic ministry to restore the prophetic uh, to the church and the understanding that each one of us as believers we are ministers we are called for ministry now do you believe that do you believe that only few of us are called for ministry or everybody is called for ministry what do you think what do you think okay um online students you can put it on the chat and others what do you think everybody's called only only some are called or everybody's called everybody's called now okay i'm coming i'm coming out with a follow-up question okay who are all saying everybody's called put your hands up okay i can see you overwhelming okay every believer wonderful clarify that krisha everybody's called okay okay so who's saying uh only some what is your name sorry francis is saying only some are called ministry again everybody's called not not everybody only some okay then what about you shira everybody's called you anand right only some are called okay <laughs> okay um okay nina is like uh, no, all are called but not everybody responds true 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 mm. many are called but only few are chosen okay the thing is okay i think that is uh, based on what nina is you know uh, more in line with what nina shared that um you know everybody's invited 
but not everybody responds. But when you respond to that invitation uh, to fall, right? Uh, we we see that okay, you you begin to experience uh, salvation, right? So many are called, but few are chosen. Why? Because they're not responded to the invitation. So okay, so the thing about, we are talking about ministry, right? So specifically about those who have already decided to follow Christ, already become disciples. So we're talking about that, uh, about those kind of people. So is everybody called to do ministry? Okay. So let's look at Ephesians four. Okay. So that's the place. Um, if anybody asks, you know, how do you know you're called to ministry? This is it. Ephesians 4, verse 11. Okay? And he himself, it's talking about the Lord, uh, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. You know, this is what we call as the fivefold ministry. right? Uh, apostles, pastors, evangelists, prophets, teachers. Okay. For, look at verse 12, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So there are three things mentioned there. You see that? Verse 12, Ephesians 4, 12. What is the first thing? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now this is why... We have the what is called as a fivefold ministry. Okay, now this fivefold ministry is for some. Okay, not all are called to be an apostle, to be a prophet, to be a pastor. Fivefold. You know, this is because it 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 uh, it is mentioned here. And he gave some to be apostles. You see that, right? Ephesians four eleven. He gave some to be this. But you look at verse twelve for the equipping of the saints. Who are the saints? Who's a saint? Hindi mein kya hai? Saint? Huh? Prerti is believer, no? Saint, is it? Saint, okay. So who is a saint? What is the meaning of saint? Who died? Who had already dead sorry sorry in the ah okay 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 saint joseph's who are holy people <laughs> okay one somebody who's called holy sant okay that's the hindi word sant is the same as prayer no no okay son apostle okay 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 good good thank you Okay, so saint, okay, the way word saint actually means one who is sanctified, consecrated, sanctified, set apart. Okay, so that's the thing. So that's the meaning, actual meaning of the word. And that's the intent with which it was used in scripture. Okay, for the equipping of the saints, which means if these are believers, they are sanctified ones. They set themselves apart to live for Christ for the equipping of the saints. Right? So every believer is a saint of God, you know, if he truly walks in consecration and sanctification. Okay. So you are a saint. Okay. Can you say that? I'm a saint. Yeah. Saint Francis is here. <laughs> so you're a saint. And yeah, I, I see all your comments here. Thank you. So, so that's the thing. So we are. So, look at this verse. It says, "Equipping of the saints for the work of, for the work of." Look at that verse. What does it say? Verse twelve. For the work of ministry. Right. So saints equipped for ministry. Saints equipped for ministry. Saints, believers, consecrated ones equipped for ministry. So all of us, every believer is to be equipped for ministry. Now, our understanding of ministry, you know, every time we think of ministry is like, I need to be preaching. I need to be standing behind a 
podium, pulpit. That's our understanding, no? But ministry literally means to serve, serve people in various ways. So, of course, every ministry, our first and foremost priority is that we need to take the message of the gospel. Right? That's the Great Commission for all believers, for all disciples. Right? Now, as a saint, I'm equipped by this fivefold ministers in the church for ministry. So, every believer, every believer is to be equipped for ministry because every believer is called for ministry now some might be called for the fivefold because that's what it says he gave some to be apostles some to be prophets some to be evangelists right but every believer is called for ministry right? so so that is the thing so if anybody everybody anybody asks you know is every believer is every christian called to be ministry yes they are but the ministry might differ Right? Some might be called to lead. Some might be called to, you know, uh, to show compassion. We look at this. You know, Romans twelve has a list. There are, you know, many other gifts that are, you know, listed and ways in which we serve the people of God. Ways in which we serve God Himself. Right? Some are called to, you know, maybe uh, start a school, maybe start an orphanage, maybe run a business, right, and run it well. And do it well. Some are called, just like Joseph and Daniel, you know, to uh, uh, to to politics. Like when I say politics, I'm seeing it in a you know in in a good way. Politics meaning to give leadership to rule the land. Like Joseph, like like even Esther, you know, to counsel. So, so that's the thing. So everybody's called. To serve God, to represent God, to serve Him, and we need to be equipped. So, this knowledge and understanding, the Holy Spirit brought back to the church in the two thousands, right? Because otherwise, people did not have a clue. They said, "Okay, you're a member, you come, attend church, go back. I'm the pastor, I will teach, because I've been called to the fivefold. I will call, I will teach you. You attend, you just come." Attend, receive, hear, go back. Right? Then this whole understanding, hey, I need to be equipping you. The pastor needs to be equipping, the church needs to be equipping the believer to discover the call, to discover the gifts, to walk in it, to be empowered to walk in it, right? And to be equipped to do ministry. So every church, literally, every part, you know, so there was this whole movement of, yeah. We need to be doing that. We need to be training our people in evangelism. We need to be training uh, about uh, various things. So, um, so yeah. So the Holy Spirit brought back. So you see these restorative moves of God, and uh, this happened, you know, starting with the Refor Reformation, and it's just continuing, right? So there is a, you know, wherever you go, there is a restoration. Uh, I mean, there is an understanding. Okay, this is what it is. So, so I see that, you know, when we when we go around we see that yes there are some churches where that understanding is not there okay maybe even um, you know about the gospel about uh, salvation sadly you know it's like but we see that by and large and people know okay this is the gospel this is what we need to be saved this is the teaching of the holy spirit it's, you know because god is bringing back god is restoring back to the church now in the let's say in the dark ages you know, people who were living in the 400s to 1400s if we were to tell people you know there would come a time when the gospel will be preached there would come a time when people will be prophesying there will come a time when people will be filled with the spirit you know they will say you know what are you talking about how can that ever happen how can that ever happen? The, the Bible is locked. We are, you know, the church is wielding so much power. They are doing so much of, you know, corrupt things and all that. How can that day ever happen? Did they ever, you know, come to pass? But the fact is God did it. God did it. He, he restored, the Holy Spirit restored these teachings. People received it. People received the revelation and walked in the truth of it. Okay. So this restorative move, is by the 
Holy Spirit. So we see that this is the move of God, the work of the Holy Spirit in the church, okay? Um, in the history of the church. Okay, any questions or anything that you might want to add to this before we go further? Any questions? Yeah, I think we have two, yeah. Uh, okay, okay, Sean. Okay, go ahead, Sean. Tithes and offerings, okay. Necessary to, okay, this is not in line with the topic, but uh, but fine, okay. <laughs> but okay, but we will. Uh, I, I think you will be learning about it. Um, but um, yeah, uh, it is scriptural. It is in the uh, scripture um, about tithes and offerings. Um, okay, if if you need some references. Um, you can look at Corinthians. Um, okay, Second Corinthians, I think it's nine. Let me just okay. Second Corinthians nine um, talks about that. Okay, um, and also okay, that, that is one reference. You can look at that. Um, then in Malachi we see that. Okay, so if it's in the Old Testament, um, of course, you know, I, I'm just giving these references, but there's a lot more we need to talk about uh, when it comes to tithes and, you know, can this continue in the New Testament in this new and age? Um, so, you know, Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 talks about that. Then in the Gospels also, the Lord Jesus, I forget that reference, but the Lord Jesus talks about, you know, tithing. And also some of these other things um, he says, and in which he says, you know, you need to, you you ought to have done this without leaving the other undone, referring to tithing and something else um, about taking care of uh, you know of people. I forget the reference. I'll share that with you. Okay, so so we see that there is scriptural you know backing for that, and uh, yeah. Okay, so Prince. Dark Ages. Worship? Yeah. So saint worship, uh, the belief came in during that time. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, in the sense, uh, they still have those beliefs, right? Uh, even relics, meaning, you know, some artifacts, something they say, okay, this was blessed. So, you know, that is also worshipped. Uh, or this belonged to someone, so that is also, you know, some someone uh, 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 holy, whatever. So artifacts, relics, these are also worshipped. So, yes, they have those beliefs. But the good thing is, the best part is that God is bringing revival even in such environments. Right? Um, okay, I think we just have a minute, but um, you know, I'll just quickly share this. You know, I, 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 and my wife and I, we went to a meeting, and this was my wife's colleagues. She was working somewhere uh, at that time. My wife's colleagues, uh, I think, father passed away or something, and then we went for you know after twenty-one days or something. She belonged to the Catholic Church, so they had some some meeting. We went there. Uh, the prayer meeting. Okay, I was very surprised. In the prayer meeting, uh, somebody preached. Somebody was giving a message. He preached the gospel, uncompromised, undiluted. He said, "You know, you need Jesus. There's nothing else. No other way to heaven." I was shocked. I was like, "Wow!" In such a meeting, such a message. I'm so happy. Then he said, "This is what Jesus said. He's gone to heaven so that he can give the Comforter." And all of you, I want to pray so that you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, you receive Jesus. So he gave an altar call to receive Christ. He, he prayed that people will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Then we were like, wow, this is amazing. This is not even happening in the church where you know, we used to worship that time. We were so happy. Then he said, okay, now, who wants to testify? You know, in full package, test, testimony time, he said, okay. And then suddenly we, we thought, okay, nobody's going to stand up. We saw people 
you know, one by one, some old gentleman, you know, standing and saying, this today was, you know, something changed in my life. For the first time, I prayed this prayer. For the first time, you know, I was just lifted my hands and I said, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And some, I just felt, I was filled. I was, I, you know, he was finding words to say, you know, we can say filled. No, he said something, you know, I felt so warm and uh, I, I was uh, so happy. I feel so much of peace. And we will, I was literally in tears. You know, I was saying, wow, God, you are doing this among this people. You know, yeah, they, they go there and this environment, they, this is what they are, but then God is doing it. So that's the that's the best part. Okay, we'll stop here, um, take a break, and come back.